on his cattle without riding a horse. He rides a bug. I laughed. That was a funny looking little thing. I call it a pregnant roller skate. And the ride is. I feel like going up and kicking it in the side. It's not a car. The popularity of the Volkswagen Beetle was that it was an anti car. I mean, it, 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 it became popular because it was uh, a counter car. We thought it was no competition, but it didn't go away. The Volkswagen Beetle was one of the most revolutionary cars of all time. It was homely, it was puny, and it embodied an idea that ran counter to everything Detroit stood for. Less is more. To drive that message home, VW launched an ad campaign that was clever and irreverent. The Volkswagen is one of the tallest cars in the world, so there's more than enough headroom, even for the little woman. Here is a brand new 1968 Volkswagen. How many changes can you find? You have 10 seconds. Look it over. Don't miss a thing, you know. Hood locks, seats, and shock absorbers. And for all these years of testing and improving the Volkswagen, we ask a mere 1780. Never before. You know, the Beetle advertising was genius, if there ever was genius, because it said, you know, buy me, I'm cheap. I look just like last year's model. We don't change from year to year. And to, an, to a growing number of people, this was tremendously appealing. I mean, because they were tired of what they considered to be Detroit flim flam. The VW's body was so tight, it would float. The engine, on the other hand, needed no water at all. It was air-cooled. The bug never boiled over, never froze, and it could go weeks between fill-ups. Its price was the big thing. All my friends were buying it because of its cost. and It ran forever for nothing, and it was kind of a fun thing to have. Bugs were perfect for families buying another car for the kids, for college professors making a statement, and for anyone wanting basic transportation. The Volkswagen Beetle eventually became the best-selling car of all time, even beating out Henry Ford's Model T. In the beginning, Detroit paid little attention to the Volkswagen, but the Japanese followed their every move. In 1957, Los Angeles was host to America's first imported auto show. The two Japanese cars on display surprised everyone. Toyota's Bluebird and Datsun's Fairlady. As one person remarked, I didn't know the Japanese even made cars. The early Japanese cars were bizarre and ugly. I mean, double ugly. And their performance matched their looks. The Datsun Fairlady boasted an engine with a whopping 37 horsepower. Just getting the car up a hill was an ordeal. The car also had bad brakes severe vibration, and other assorted quirks. It did get good gas mileage, but with gasoline at 30 cents a gallon, no one much cared. Nissan, who made the car, knew they'd have to fix the Datsun's most obvious shortcomings. So engineers spent weeks driving the tiny car up and down the Los Angeles freeways. And it was finally while they were driving one and experimenting and upgrading it, when they beat a VW on a hill that they knew they could do it. The VW was the target. 
And they just kept coming. The cars kept getting better, the performance was better. They learned very quickly. The learning curve was very short for them. Nissan sold only 52 Datsuns in 1958. So they sent one of their most outspoken managers to Los Angeles with instructions to create a dealer network from scratch. By the age of 50, Yutaka Katayama had stepped on a few too many toes. He was known more as a rebel than a company man, openly criticizing what he thought were bad management decisions. He was really sent to America, I think, largely to fail. They didn't know what else to do with him. I thought, they well, you know, we're not going to be that successful in America, so send Katayama. If we fail, it's his failure. Well, when I arrived at uh, Los Angeles, oh, I came to a very free country and uh, made me feel mm, very good. One of the first people Katayama hired was John Parker, who would create Datsun's advertising for the next 18 years. His English was bad, my Japanese was even worse. Uh, we sat and smoked cigarettes, drank tea, talked philosophy and, and uh, about life and, and how uh, we had uh, a great opportunity. If there was a great opportunity, Katayama was the only one who saw it. Pearl Harbor had left many Americans feeling anti-Japanese, and the Datsun product was clunky. And Katayama knew almost no one in the U.S. Uh, Katayama got his start, literally, driving a Datsun car to a guy that's got a corner garage or maybe a used car lot and says in his very broken English, wouldn't you like to sell Datsun cars and trucks? And uh, I think about 99% of the time the guy would say, get out of here. Well, I'll tell you, it was so tough. It was hard, <laughs> hard to get new dealers. It really was. In terms of the kinds of people that that these were, that they were an amazing assortment. I used to wonder whether some of them had ever had a, a real suit, a pair of pants and a coat that matched. The dealers loved Mr. Katayama. He was uh, almost like a Billy Graham to them. He'd get up there and in his broken English he'd say, you make money, we make money. You build bigger facility, we'll build a bigger facility. You sell more cars, we'll get more cars. And A would talk to B, and B would talk to C, and C would talk to his brother-in-law and say, I think we ought to start a business. And that's the way the thing started to grow. So we started on a wing and a prayer. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we had some good product coming along. The sound, the sound move is to Datsun. Four-door, wagon, pickup, two Datsun sports cars and a four-wheel drive patrol. By the late 60s, Datsuns featured overhead cam engines, disc brakes, and color-coordinated interiors. Sound moved to solid comfort, rattle-free Datsun unit bodies, four- and five-speed all-synchro mesh transmission. Things were looking up. Little did they know that an event halfway around the world was about to make them an overnight success. In 1973, the unthinkable happened. Our gas pumps suddenly ran dry. The oil-producing nations of the Middle East had decided to play hardball. They wanted more money for their oil, and they weren't going to sell a drop of it until they got the price they wanted. That's how desperate people were. I remember the long lines that we sat in, people following fuel delivery trucks down the road to see which gas station they were going to stop at. Uh, I've been in those lines for two and a half, three hours and got all the way up there and five cars ahead of me, they've run out of gas after being in the line for three hours. Talk about disheartening. <laughs> Suddenly, Americans were faced with the horrifying prospect of having our freedom taken away from us because the car had always symbolized freedom, freedom to go when you want, as far as you want, and basically fairly cheaply. Um, the oil crisis meant that that might not be the case anymore, and that was horrifying. The oil crisis began showing up everywhere, even in the movies. In 1973, a group of college students got together and made a movie called Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Here comes Here's how the movie goes. Uh, there are five teenagers in a uh, van, and they stop at a golf station because they're running low on gas. Would you fill her up, please? I got no gas. You're out of gas? 
My tank's empty. Before the movie is over, uh, four of the five have been murdered by various members of a family of cannibals. So either they sell you gasoline. We ought to go to that gas station and get help. Or they don't sell you gasoline. In which case they kill you and turn you into barbecue and sell the barbecue to uh, other folks who stop for gas. I got some good barbecue here. Why don't you fellas stick around here a while? But I think that movie gets at the heart of uh, a very great fear uh, for a lot of Americans that if we ever run out of gas, if we, if we can't drive or not, can't drive as much as we'd like to, we're going to die. This is one of our most valuable resources, a gallon of gasoline. Put it in the average car and you'll get about 13 and a half miles. Put it in a Datsun 1200 and you'll get around 30 miles. Suddenly, there was a mad stampede for small, fuel-efficient cars. And Detroit was caught off guard. The Japanese had all these little cars, and so when the demand came so instantly, they were poised to have a field day. They had a banquet. They feasted on us. I mean, because they were there, and people wondered. The imported car was here to stay, and Detroit was in for a bumpy ride. At Datsun, the dealers could hardly believe their good fortune. The dealers changed as a group. Uh, you could just see the change from meeting to meeting. Uh, they got slicked up, and the, the wives got slicked up, and you saw more fur coats, and uh, the evidences of, uh, of improving sales became very obvious. I had lots of uh, millionaires in the United States. I made uh, lots of uh, millionaires. These people made their own success and knew that Datsun and to a certain extent Mr. Katayama were a very, very integral part of that success. <laughs> <laughs>